In 2016, a suburban train was moving along its usual route towards Berlin, when suddenly one of the passengers felt unwell. Unfortunately, it was not possible to save him, and the 37-year-old man passed away due to heart failure. Despite the sorrowful nature of his death, he did of natural causes, however, his departure from life triggered a chain of events that led to the resolution of a case that had remained a mystery for 23 years. The German town of Bedbig, which was simply known as Belig until 2010, is located 70 kilometers southwest of Berlin today. It is home to 11,000 people. Bad Big is considered a historic town because it houses the medieval fortress of Eisenhardt Castle. Berg, Eisenhardt first mentioned in a document from the year 997 issued by Emperor Otto III, which is quite impressive apart from the castle. One of the main attractions of the town is the thermal complex called Stein Therm, where families and groups of friends often gather on weekends for leisure and relaxation. Overall, Bad Big appears to be an excellent town for family living among the families who settled in. The town was the family of Andrea Logan, Andrea her sister, as well as their parents. Rosemary and Freddie lived on the outskirts of the city in a new residential complex. Andrea was born on January 6, 1977, and by 1993 had grown into an attractive 16-year-old girl. Andrea was in the 11th grade and eagerly awaited finishing school as one of the top students in her class. She felt confident about her future studies at the university. She was a responsible, intelligent, serious, well, read girl, yet sociable and friendly. Everyone who knew her sincerely loved her on Thursday, October 7, 1993. There were only two school days left before the holidays. Naturally, Andrea was looking forward to the upcoming vacation shopping parties and meetings with friends on that day. Her parents decided to spoil their da daughter and took her to a large shopping center where they bought Andrea a pair of platform shoes and Levi's jeans. She had been eyeing for a while at 6 war in the evening when they returned home. Andrea, as usual, turned on the music cassette of her favorite band Alphaville and began selecting what to wear with her new items. Of course, she was in high spirits indeed, like any teenager. She couldn't wait to show off her new outfit to her friends that same evening, and Andrea knew the ideal place to reach as large an audience as possible for this. After dinner around 8 Wuhaim in the evening, Andrea called her friend to arrange a walk, but she was already in Potampogo, was the name of the local club where teenagers like to gather. As it often happens with clubs in small towns, it was conveniently located, equidistant from the homes of local families, and Andrea and her friends were regular visitors. Pogo was a 15-minute walk from her home, and considering the short distance the girl often walked instead of waiting for the bus, she hadn't learned to drive a car yet. Moreover, in a small town, she felt safe walking alone in the evening, and her parents were not afraid to let her go out alone. Besides, in the evening, the likelihood of not meeting anyone on the way was higher than encountering someone unfriendly. So on October 7th, as always, Andrea decided to walk first, asking her parents for permission to leave for a few hours. They agreed, asking her to return no later than 10 UIs. Andrea agreed without argument and left home at 8 hour in the evening that evening, as always. When their daughter left home, her parents stayed awake expecting Andrea. But when the clock struck 10, in the evening, the girl hadn't returned home at first. The parents thought she was caught up, socializing with friends and either forgot about the time or didn't manage to leave the club on time. They waited a little longer, constantly peeking out the window, hoping to catch a glimpse of their daughter an hour past then a second. But it grew later, and Rosemary and Freddie became increasingly worried. What troubled them particularly was that Andrea was one of the best students in her class, which meant she knew she had to go to school the next day. Therefore, it seemed unlikely for her to intentionally stay out late. It was completely out of character for her because she was a very responsible girl who always came home on time and listened to her parents complicating matters. Was the fact that in 1993, teenagers didn't have mobile phones. Andrea couldn't write or call her parents if she was delayed and they couldn't find out her way whereabouts by 12.30, unable to contain their worry. The parents began calling her friends, hoping that perhaps she stayed the night at one of their places, as they were closer. But of course, that wasn't the case. No one knew where she was at one bars in the morning, driven mad by worry. Her father, Freddy, decided to look for her himself. He drove several times along the road. She should have taken to the club, went through other, more remote streets, but he couldn't find his daughter shortly before 4 hour in the, the morning. He went to the police station and reported his daughter missing. He probably hoped that the police would act immediately because several hours had passed since she was supposed to return home, but he was mistaken. Officers believed it was too early to take any action. 
Although this was extremely upsetting and disappointing for the girl's parents, those were the rules the police often receive reports of missing persons, especially when it involves a teenager, and they prefer to wait a day before taking action because teenagers usually return on their own the next morning on the other hand. How many reports of missing teenagers could the police get in a town of 11,000 people? Besides, Andrea wasn't a problematic teenager. She had no reason to run away, no conflicts at home or with friends. Andrea was a happy girl who had just returned from shopping. The holidays were near and she was allowed to hang out and enjoy her youth with friends. Her parents were convinced that Andrea wouldn't have run away, but the fact remained for Rosemary and Freddie. This must have been a real nightmare sitting at home unable to rest fearing for their daughter's life, constantly imagining scenarios of what might have happened to her, knowing that nobody was even looking for her on the following day. January 8th. Andrea's mother Rosemary also attempted to search for her daughter independently. It's understandable that waiting for the police to take action might have been a real torment. She walked through the town center and along the path Andrea was supposed to take, about a hundred met from the Pogo Club. She noticed a wooded area. Interestingly, this plot belonged to the grandfather of Andrea's former boyfriend, a boy a little older than her, from whom she had parted ways just a few weeks before her disappearance while exploring this area. The girl's mother stumbled upon a hut where she found a mattress and a hand towel lying around at that moment, surrounded by trees and hearing. Only the barking of dogs, she suddenly felt very uncomfortable, almost physically sensing that something was. A missuspicion crept into her mind that Andrea's former boy boyfriend might have something to do with her disappearance, and she would continue to believe this for a long time, convinced that detectives should inspect this area. She reported it to the police, but once again, they did nothing. They explained that they didn't see any reason or concrete evidence to investigate this territory. It was unclear where the evidence could have come from if they hadn't started their work yet. Perhaps they should have looked for clues in the hut. Nevertheless, they clarified to Rosemary that they didn't have a warrant, meaning they couldn't leave Algo there only a week after the teenager's disappearance did the police finally begin their work law enforcement, checked hospitals and transportation, leaving Bag Big, the place where Andrea could have departed from helicopters flew over the forests of the town for several days, while ground search teams, including dog handlers, scoured the area. Dog handlers searched the route between the girl's home and Pogo and examined the surrounding areas to precisely establish Andrea's last actions. Detectives interviewed all possible witnesses, everyone present at Pogo on that evening. However, it proved quite challenging as the police had waited for an entire week, and teenagers frequented Pogo every day, they were now confused about the specific day and couldn't accurately confirm if they had seen Andrea at the club on October 7th. Fortunately, after speaking with 21-year-old Ivan Eskin, a club employee, they were able to confirm that Andrea was there on the 7th. Yvonne remembered seeing Andrea standing outside the club. While she couldn't recall the exact time, it was definitely before 10 p.m. Because Pogo closes at 10 p.m., other witnesses remembered seeing Andrea walking along a dark road towards the club. Another witness reported seeing her talking to two boys. The police questioned 13-year-old Robin and 14-year-old David, who confirmed exchanging a few words with Andrea as she was returning from the club, after which she went home while the boys went in the opposite direction. The police began to suspect, suspect that Andrea might have taken an isolated narrow path that would have been plunged into complete darkness. At that late hour, the locals referred to this path as the lover's path located between the homes of two families, which would have allowed the girl to reach home much faster than the main road. However, the police could never confirm whether she indeed took the lover's path because neither the canine units nor the forensic experts found any evidence supporting this theory. Nonetheless, this secret path was often used by teenagers returning from the club to attract more attention to the case. Andrea's photo was shown on television and a reward of 10,000 marks was offered for information that could help find her. The police asked anyone who could assist them in bringing the girl back home safely to contact them. They received over 250 reports stating that Andrea Logan had been seen in various countries around the world, Turkey, Greece, Luxembourg, Switzerland, and Spain. However, despite the police's efforts to investigate each lead, none of them led to any breakthroughs. Eventually, the police admitted defeat as they had nothing to work with and the investigation came to a standstill. The case remained unsolved and Andrea Logan was no longer sought after by anyone other than her family. Seven years later on July 9, 2000, 
a local resident was enjoying her morning coffee on a beautiful day when she saw Josie, her landlord's dog, joyfully playing with something resembling a soccer ball. However, upon closer inspection, the woman realized that it wasn't a ball, but a human skull. She hurriedly called the police soon. Frank Friedrich, the woman's landlord, arrived unexpectedly. He claimed that he had already seen the skull, took it from the dog, and hid it before leaving to celebrate his parents' birthday. Upon returning home to address the matter, the police were already there. The man explained his peculiar behavior by stating that he knew that during World War II, prisoners of war were held in that area, so he assumed the skull was quite old, therefore he hid it. Intending to deal with it later when the police inspected the area, where the skull presumably that of Andrea was found by the dog, it turned out to be the very same location warned about by Andrea's mother just 10 millimeters behind the lover's path and 100 millimeters from Pogo inside a long abandoned cabin behind a weathered door simply leaning against the wall, the police found the rest of the skeleton. Thus, if the killer attempted to hide the body, they hadn't put in much effort. Surprisingly, despite the police searching this location with sniffer dogs in 1993, nobody noticed or smelled anything. Journalists, reporters, the landlord's dogs, construction workers and local residents had visited the site all departing with the same outcome naturally. The locals convinced the remains belonged to Andrea were furious at how the police handled the investigation. The police defended their actions stating they had investigated the area only a week after the girl's disappearance. Supposedly they had acted very promptly since the police are obligated to search for a missing person only if there are suspicions of a crime or several weeks after the disappearance regardless. The remains were sent to a laboratory confirming they indeed belonged to. Andrea DNA comparison was unnecessary as the victim's dental records matched the teeth in the skull. Although the girl's remains were found, the forensic expert couldn't determine how she was killed or what happened before her death as only the skeleton remained. However, he noted a head injury on the skull. Notably, Andrea was found not where the murder occurred, her clothing wasn't found in the cabin, even her watch and favorite ring were missing to this day. It remains unknown whether this implies the victim was assaulted, causing her clothes to be removed, or if they were taken to conceal evidence. If the latter is true, the perpetrator's actions seemed senseless, because the body wasn't even hidden. With the discovery of the remains, the case was reopened, but it was now a murder investigation for Andrea Lohagen at this point. Both the police and the town's people questioned what the motive for the murder could have been. They were especially troubled by the fact that the lover's path near where the body was found was only known to a limited number of locals suggesting the killer lived in Bad Big and possibly was still among them. However, despite this breakthrough and a reward of $5,000 for any information, the police still lacked substantial leads leaving the case unsolved for many years. Everything changed in the summer of 2016 when an unknown woman called the police claiming she precisely knew who killed Andrea Logan. Her friend, 37-year-old David, he was one of the two boys who had met Andrea on her way from Pogo at the time of Andrea's disappearance. David was 14 years old as an adult. David was a loner who enjoyed solitude, struggled to hold a the job due to alcohol and substance abuse issues, and this lifestyle undoubtedly led to health problems. The woman who called the police explained that the reason she decided to share this information was that David had died in the same year, 2016. He was on a train to Berlin when he suddenly fell ill and passed away due to natural causes. It is unknown how long this woman had been holding on to this information. David left no other confessions. The only evidence hinting at his guilty conscience was a dark post on a social media platform. In the photo, a man wearing a shirt with the inscription wanted is seen holding a small child underneath the image. He wrote, you can do the right thing a thousand times, but make one mistake and you're worthless. The police tried to learn from David's mother what she knew about the matter perhaps if her son had confessed to her about the crime. However, she was reluctant to speak with the officers after all. She still lived in the same town where Andrea went missing and where her family resided. Eventually, she admitted that her son had had told her they and a friend had planned to rob Andrea, but everything went wrong and Andrea was killed. That was all she knew. The woman who called the police added that at the time of David's murder, he wasn't alone. He was with his then 13-year-old friend Robin in 2016, 36-year-old Robin lived in Tyel, Austria with his wife and two children worked on a dairy farm, was very quiet, friendly, and spent evenings at home. He was so secretive that his colleagues only learned about his wedding after he decided to change his surname following the marriage. Robin was questioned on October 27, 2016. But since he was 13 years old at the time of the crime, he was questioned only as a witness. 
Not a suspect, law enforcement couldn't imprison him, even if he confessed to the crime, as he was below the age of criminal responsibility, at 13 of course. This doesn't seem right. If you understand how to take someone's life, you should be punished in some way during the conversation. Robin didn't deny David's involvement in the crime, but asked for the opportunity to discuss his own participation after speaking with his family. He was allowed to go home and was given a new date to return to the station for further questioning. However, police soon realized that Robin's desire to talk to his family wasn't the real reason for refusing to speak with them. It was merely an excuse to leave the station indeed, just a few hours after returning home. He left again but before that, he left a farewell note for his wife. He put on hiking boots, got into the car and headed towards Pending Mountain located approximately 15 kilometer from his home. There he climbed the mountain and jumped from it four days later on November 4th. His body was found by a hunter in the note to his wife. He didn't explain anything, just bid farewell. The police chief later mentioned that when the detective spoke with Robin, they explained to him that he wouldn't face any problems, no prison sentence, they just wanted to know. Know why he did it. They wanted Andrea's parents to get answers to the questions that had tormented them for so many years. But Robin decided otherwise, it was undoubtedly difficult for Andrea's parents to come to terms with his departure, with his departure their last chance to find out the motive behind the murder disappeared, what happened it just before Andrea's death, and how exactly she died, why they removed her clothes, and how long the girl remained alive also, where exactly everything happened, however it's very interesting that the plot where the cabin was located belonged not only to Andrea's former boyfriend, but also to one of the boy's grandfathers. This is because Andrea's ex-boyfriend and Robin were cousins. David and Robin were troublesome teenagers, well known throughout the town. They were often seen smoking or drinking alcohol. Soon they embarked on a series of burglaries, after which they served time in juvenile detention. So it couldn't be said that they were kids whom no one could suspect of anything, but murder is something much more significant than breaking into someone's house and stealing valuable items. Detectives spoke with the boys soon after they as later revealed killed Andrea. At that time, they were not suspected of anything, they were just witnesses. But one can't help but wonder if you're 13 or 14 years old, and you've just committed murder. How composed will you be when the police come, questioning you? The detective who interacted with them in 1993 recalls that they were calm and rational. However, they asked various strange questions like, what it's like to be in juvenile detention as a murderer? Additionally, when the detective went to one of the boys' homes, he saw a cassette with inappropriate films on the table. Moreover, when he asked each of the boys to clarify where they met Andrea and which road they took afterward, their statements differed. Nevertheless, the oddities in the boys' behavior and the discrepancies in their statements were not sufficient to accuse them of anything. Certainly, there are many cases where investigators did not hesitate to pressure teenagers and interrogate them for hours on end in pursuit of a confession. But not in this case, perhaps the police didn't want to interrogate and pressure David and Robin for long considering their age. Although the police officially closed the case, Andrea's parents are not convinced they suspect that a third person was involved in the murder. Freddie, the girl's father, couldn't believe that two young boys committed such a heinous crime without the help guidance or at least the influence of an adult or someone older than them. Rosemary and Freddie are convinced that they had assistance. Andrea's mother's intuition has proven right before. What if her intuition isn't wrong this time? It was a completely senseless and cruel murder. And even before the killer's death, they did not alleviate the suffering of the victim's parents. Shortly before Andrea's death, she wrote an essay titled, The Tale of Happiness. Andrea narrated an encounter with an old man who told her, I worry about you because you seem so sad. He promised to grant her three wishes. The, the first was a journey at 16 and the second was a happy future. Andrea being prudent didn't want to waste the third wish explaining who knows what will come after, as I am already happy however pitiful in existence. The killers might lead, even if they remembered the crime they committed every day, they could move on. But for Andrea who loved life so much, hers was taken away. 